Okay, so could you please state your full name? Gordon Malcolm Ritzy. And your age, please? Almost 86. And um, where were you born? Halifax, Nova Scotia. Okay. And uh, what did your parents do as, when you were a child? My uh, mother was uh, worked in the bank as a teller, I guess. But that was before I was born, so I don't know anything about that. And my father was an accountant, uh, vice president eventually of a uh, um, shipboat fitting firm in Halifax. Okay. And uh, you as a child, what did you do? What were your pastimes or your interests? Uh, the summer would be uh, baseball, uh, cycling, hiking, camping, in the winter uh, uh, skiing, skating. So all the, you were a sporty guy. Yeah. And um, at school, were your, what were your interests? Were they um, geared towards the sciences or what were your strengths? Uh, I guess I was interested in everything at school until I got into uh, about grade 11 and then I wasn't too interested in math by that at that time. Um, and I suppose in grade 12, uh, physics was not all that <laughs> exciting to me, but I was strong in chemistry all through. Because my dad had uh, built a lab for me, uh, I don't know, somewhere when I was about 14 or 15 in the basement and uh, I guess probably because he wanted to be uh, to, to go to university when he was uh, a teenager and take chemistry that was I didn't know this until years later okay but uh, that was his passion yeah and it turned out to be mine and he got to live uh, vicariously through you. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. No. So you went into chemistry. What? What? Uh, yeah. What was gonna? What did you decide your path uh, to be in uh, after high school? My path actually from about grade about age six was to be a medical doctor, and. Uh, so when I entered university, it was in pre-med and uh, because I was entering at the time of the war vets coming back uh, from the war in 45, uh, I was entering in 47. Uh, it was still pretty difficult to get into university as uh, coming from high school. And of course, in Halifax, uh, they only went to grade 12, which Ontario does now. So I, I entered uh, from grade 11. You didn't have to take grade 12. You could take grade 12, but, uh, and you've got five credits if you took an arts degree in university, but I was not taking arts, pre-med, I would get two credits so I decided to go right from right from grade 11 and uh, so I enrolled in in, in pre-med but this passion for chemistry I expanded that pre-med to a bachelor of science in chemistry and took every chemistry the university offered including all the medical chemistries, <laughs> pharmaceuticals and whatnot. So uh, the other passion was music. And uh, they gave me a test when I entered university as to what I should be doing. And uh, the bottom line of that testing was that I should not be going into science 
I should be, or medicine, I should be good. Mm. In university. And your other passion was music. Music, yeah. So immediately found out that I played the piano. They said, well, we want you in the orchestra, but we have a piano player. We, wa we want you to play the uh, tuba. And I says, well, I've never, never played the tuba. I've played horns because I was in the Navy band of the reserve. And so I played a couple of different horns. And uh, he says, oh, well, take the horn home with you and, and uh, you, you can read the notes. And so I was self-taught. And so two weeks later, uh, I was with the band, with the orchestra, playing uh, HMS Pinafore, Gilbert and Sullivan. And I guess a couple weeks later, we actually put on uh, the performance, uh, full, full dress performance. And uh, so the uh, tuba in the orchestra led to the uh, university band asking me to come with the band and football games and the hockey oh, yeah. games all over the province, uh, which was okay until I get to uh, uh, Katy University, the uh, right in the heart of the Annapolis Valley, and and of course all the apples. So the we'd be marching down the street and the Acadia kids would uh, be throwing apples <laughs> at this big t target of the tuba. <laughs> Trying so, to throw them in or? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so by the time we got to the, to the university itself, uh, get to get ready for the game, uh, I couldn't blow it all in this thing. It was jammed. Yeah, so I had flushed it with a hose. Wow. So that happened every, every game, every uh, <laughs> football game, not the hockey games. It was the, Those were okay. They just hated on the tuba player. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. And um, so did you ever go back to piano or...? Tuba is your, your instrument now. No, no, I never went back to the horns. Okay. I, I, I was off because when I finished university, I, uh, within six months, uh, I was up in the Arctic and uh, there was no piano there for a while. And I, didn't have a piano when I came down here five years later. So I was off music for oh, about 10 years, I guess. Okay. And uh, I remembered near everything I, I knew on music, but uh, it's never the same, you forget. So, but I think my first year at university, or the year before I went to university, my my piano teacher, because uh, I I'd started piano the year before, so that was about I was I guess about fifteen, and uh, she was a neighbor, and uh, I had seen three showings of. Uh, a, a song to remember, which was a story about Chopin, and uh, I got excited about getting into music again, because my parents had uh, had me go to music uh, piano lessons when I was about ten years old, I suppose, maybe younger, and I hated it. Yeah. Hated it rather. Passion. Sometimes you're just too young. Yeah, well, I, I couldn't stand the scales and the technique. 
Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I asked my parents if, uh, if I could start music again, and they said, sure. And uh, I said, well, there's mother of one of my friends just up the street. She was a piano player. Well, my mother was a good piano player, but I figured it was better to go to somebody outside the family. So I uh, went over the next day and asked this lady if uh, she'd teach me, and she said, sure. Uh, I said, well, I got a couple of conditions. One is, uh, here's here's a book. I had bought this book on Chopin, uh, mixed uh, type of music. And uh, the second is I don't want to play any scales or exercises. And she says, well, you can't learn music without those. And I says, well, Chopin's music has got a lot of this type of music. That's, that's his music. She says, yeah, you're right. So uh, she, where do you want to start? And I said, page one. <laughs> Ambitious. <laughs> and uh, so that was some around October, I guess. So first of May, she, uh, after I have my lesson, she said, well, she says, I've got you uh, slated to play at the cathedral next Wednesday. And uh, he said, she said, you're to play a, an hour. Uh, and she said, you, you, you've remembered, you've memorized everything you've played. She, she says, you hardly ever use the notes anymore. So she said, just go there and sit down and play. So that's what I did. Nice. And uh, she said, I want you to keep it up because you're destined for Carnegie Hall. <laughs> I, I could do it at that time, but I could also build any chemistry mm -hmm. um, compound I wanted in the pharmaceutical side, the organic side. So, uh, so it was a dilemma. It was a dilemma for a couple of days. And do you, do you ever regret not uh, going into music as opposed to chemistry? No, my my decision was. I can get by with music. I wouldn't never attain a, a high living and if I missed not getting into a place like Carnegie yeah. Hall status. Which is I mean, very difficult. <laughs> there's only a few get there. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, but I could make a good living as a chemist. Yeah, music was more realistic as a hobby. And as a hobby, For exactly. Sure. So that's what it is. So uh, I'll sit down, play a, an hour or two every day. And nice. Sometimes I don't feel like playing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, same here. It's it's the uh, that's what music is about, I guess. Absolutely. So you uh, <coughs> you said after school that you went up to the Arctic, was that one of your first uh, official jobs? No, the first, uh, the first job uh, was in Ottawa as a summer student, because by that time, uh, I, like I had my degree, mm -hmm. my undergraduate degree, and by special uh, um, permission from the president of the university, I was allowed to stay in the undergraduate faculty. I wanted to take one more chemistry, and but I wanted to take my master's. And at the same time, I was in medical school doing my first year, so that my last year, my fifth year, I was in three faculties, undergraduate, master's, and medicine. How, 
how in the world were you thinking of juggling a master's in, uh, in med school? <laughs> uh, I didn't do any thinking about that okay. sort of thing. I you just, just did. I had a bike, and I just went from there to down two or three kilometers to the med school and quickly get back to one of the other classes. And uh, so, uh, somewhere around uh, March, I suppose, of my graduation year, the girl that uh, I was sharing this lab with we were both working on our masters. <clears throat> uh, she says, "Cord," she said, uh, "What are you going to do? What, what, where are you going to go for your PhD?" I says, "I'm not interested in the PhD." I says, "I'm in medical school. That's, that's, I want a med MD." And she says, "Well, why are you taking the masters?" So we're sitting across, you know, having our coffee at about three o'clock in the morning doing this. And I says, you're right. <laughs> I don't need this degree. So I got up and shook hands with her. I says, good to know you, Yvette. Great. Good luck. And uh, I says, I'm, I'm leaving. So I had, uh, had all my research essentially done and uh, just that it wasn't written up. Um, it's too bad I didn't write it up because uh, that research that I did was the chemical, the same chemical configuration that 10 years later became the start of this solvent extraction of uranium and copper and everything, all the other metals we're doing mm -hmm. since then. So that was uh, that was the forerunner. They, my <coughs> two professors, because uh, I majored in uh, inorganic and organic chemistry, uh, they set uh, the objectives for my masters as development of. Uh, organic molecule that was capable of the coordination extraction of tin. So within a month or two, I had this compound built and, and working. I could extract tin, I could extract copper and some other metals change the acidity. So uh, that was a little bit of short-sightedness there. Uh, I, so when I, when I graduated, I had the, uh, I was still in medical school and I went to Ottawa. Ottawa had offered me this job of at the radioactivity division of Energy Mines Resources. And it was working on uh, uranium, extraction of uranium from their present operating plant up in the Arctic, uh, on Great Bear Lake, and also working on the development of their new plant that was coming on stream in 54, I think it was, 1954. Uh, different type of circuit. And uh, I, I had I'd put in this one application and I guess they had about 2,000 applicants and they, they hired seven out of that 2,000. Um, you were one of them? I was one of them. <laughs> and uh, oh, and the other 
was the extraction, the isolation of cobalt, because the mine up in the Arctic Port Radium uh, of El Dorado Mining and Refining, uh, it had about 45 metals in their ore, very complex ore, and amongst them was very high cobalt. So the, that project was to extract and isolate cobalt. This was for the co what they called the cobalt bomb in those days. It was really f uh, um, a radioactive tool. They produced cobalt-60, and this was to um, for x-rays. Okay. And just before the Labor Day weekend, I was called in by the director uh, of, of that uh, operation in, on Lydia Street, it was, of Energy Mines Resources. This is uh, called uh, the Radioactivity Division. Uh, asked if I would go up to the mine and uh, in the Arctic, yeah, yeah, and be chief chemist. So this was right after uh, your MD, or no? Yeah, no. This was uh, this was after my ma uh, bachelor's, bachelor's degree. Okay, and and had you started your MD yet? I had already had that one year. Okay, uh, and I, so I was just up in Ottawa just for the summer. Okay. So, asked them if I'd go up there. So, phoned my parents, told them the story. I said, phone our doctor, who is the head of the medical school, and see whether they'll keep my place, or, mm. or should I go, or what? Get some advice from the doctor. And, uh, and, f and phone, and I'll phone you back tomorrow night. So, uh, phone back, and they said, "Well, the uh, the, the doctor says uh, your place, the medical school, will be kept. Every year they admit forty-four. That's the bit number of beds that Dalhousie had uh, in the uh, hospital mm -hmm. in Halifax." So that was the um, restriction. Um, the doctor had told my parents that yes, take the year off, and uh, because I've had a lot of sickness during the the five years at university, and uh, come back after a year. Well, I never went back. No. So I became a medical school dropout. <laughs> uh, I, I just loved the, the mining philosophy, the, uh, the whole new horizon of uh, being out, out cloistered in a in a lab or a, 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 not a school, but a, a medical facility. I mean, I, at, the, at that point, even after my first year of medicine, the professors were saying I should uh, go into medical research and develop some more pharmaceuticals. Uh, I had my eye on being a, a plastic surgeon. That was my. Oh, yeah. And in high school, we had to write a, a, a booklet. Uh, it was called a career booklet or something like that. And uh, I. 
titled it Medicine and uh, Plastic Surgery. And this was all just new. This was all developed during the war. Penicillin was the big drug. And uh, lo and behold, I won the prize for the best career book in uh, Halifax that year. And, uh, and the prize that I got was a book about a, a surgeon in the Burma, a Canadian, uh, North American surgeon, I forget what his Canadian, I uh, still have it. Um, so I, I had a lot of incentive to, to be, uh, to go in, in that route. Into medicine. Yeah. <clears throat> I had uh, I had started working in the drugstore down the street from my home when I was about uh, 12, I guess, uh, delivering prescriptions on my bike. And as I got older and uh, in university, I would then help behind the counter uh, with prescriptions under their direction, of course. So, uh, got in my blood somehow. Sorry? It, it got into my blood. Yeah. That, and, and then getting, so it was quite a departure going from a city and in, with that idea of medicine and going yeah. up into the Arctic which is quite barren, bleak, very, very cold, most beautiful summers you ever see now. Uh, caribou, wolves, and, uh, and I enjoyed uh, the rocks, the very various types of ore specimens and minerals and I could just not stay with that. Yeah. So this was uh, for, um, this was with El Dorado Mines? Yeah. Okay. So you became their chief chemist up, yeah. up uh, where was it in the Arctic? It's uh, on Great Bear Lake, okay. Port Radium. Port Radium, you said, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, they, and from there did you... Did they, as chief chemist, did you start some work on radioactivity or? Yeah. Yeah, we start, started developing methods uh, for the analysis of uh, that particular type of ore with all those minerals and the solutions derived from the, during the process. And uh, and then, of course, I got into electronics and uh, the uh, maintenance of Geiger counters underground. So I'd go down underground every day in the morning and come back an hour later. So I, I didn't get uh, any uh, great radiation from uh, the underground workings. I got a lot of excess radiation when I was still in school and uh, had an operation of tonsils and, ad and adenoids and they left me under too long, I guess, uh, and so I got burnt from the anesthetic and they tried all sorts of treatments and uh, Eventually, uh, they went to radiation treatments and got into the hospital one day. This is about the fourth treatment. And the nurse put me, put all the lead around me, but can't do much on the face because that's where they were, had the radiation. She went off for, co for coffee and forgot about me. Actually? Yeah. And uh, I got out from under this. I should have been in there for 
two or three minutes. I was there for more than twenty, and uh, I knew I was there too long. But I walked out of the hospital, got on my bike, and I'd only gone two or three meters when the blood just gushed, and uh, I collapsed on the on the street in front of the hospital. And uh, years later, when I left El Dorado, 15 years later, they, uh, the, the government, uh, yeah, I guess it was El Dorado's physicians. Anyway, when they heard the story and they calculated the radiation doses that I got there, the radiation dosage I got from working, the doctor sits back and he says, I can't believe it. He says, you should have been dead long ago. He says, your working radiation is nothing compared to that one hospital treatment. Yeah. So, of course, I, I lost every hair in the head. I, I used to have a big shock of uh, curly hair and I went completely bald from that and uh, all came back, but not as much. <laughs> yeah, not as much. <laughs> of course, I didn't like the curls anyway. <laughs> no? Did they come back straight? Yeah. Oh, yeah? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So, uh, how long did you work up uh, up north with Alvarado? About five years. Okay. And about and then, ten down here and with what did Alvarado. You do, uh, what did you do down here? I was uh, assistant uh, chief of the. Uh, well, what was it called? As assistant chemist. I uh, know. Assistant chief chemist. I guess was the title. But I came here, and then I transferred over into. So that was still analytical. Uh, then I transferred over from that group to uh, process metallurgy, and became head of that. And so, as opposed to developing analytical methods in small beakers, then I'm talking about. Uh, uh, gallons and pounds or tonnage quantities when you're running uh, a plant. So uh, that's where I, I remained is uh, in process metallurgy. Okay. And when I went from there to uh, the, the government lab again, the same pretty well the same group that I had been there as a summer student 20 year, 15 years earlier. Uh, that's when I went as, you know, research and processes. For, uh, so this was for Canada? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, at that time it was called the Mines Branch. Um, Yeah. Let's see. When I uh, when I was there as uh, a summer student, it was called Mines and Technical Surveys. When I went back, it was called Energy Mines and Resources. And uh, and the division was ca called uh, CanMet. Not quite sure what this call now. Uh, Canmet, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if there's a um, what specific division, but yeah, Canmet. They Four still have yeah branch of NRCan. Nar yeah, that's that's what I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah, Natural Resources Canada. Yeah. Yeah. So you um, you did quite a bit of work with uh, uranium for Canmet. Yeah. Could you could you talk a bit about that? Yeah. The. Uh, 
because of my background, I guess, at uh, El Dorado, um, one of the jobs that uh, it, it took me to all the new mines, new uranium mines that were being developed. So at that time, which would be 1957, when I joined uh, the government, because Port Radium, or El Dorado was the crown company. Okay. So it, uh, it, although it came under the umbrella of, uh, of, of the government, the most, really most of the financing was done on the uranium they sold. So they, they were self-sufficient. Uh, with the government uh, at that time, there were one of the things that that the radioactivity division did, where I originally started, and which CanMet continued, was to uh, help these new mines starting up on their process metallurgy. Uh, how, how to treat the ore and how to recover the uranium from it with the highest possible uh, grade of product. And so each uh, ore responds slightly differently to the same process, and so you've got to uh, tailor make the process a little bit depend on the mineralogy of that that new plant. Was this all uh, hydrometallurgy? Yeah. Or, okay. So it was all with solutions? Always solutions. Um, so, some of the ores had to uh, undergo uh, a flotation process for concentration or separation of, of a commodity. Uh, but Generally speaking, the, the tail end was somewhere. So th that, as, as part of this help to the mine, I would go around to talk to the chemists, and talk to the people, sometimes get involved with a pile of plants for a short time. Um, so we, we would have, uh, the ores from these different mines on test at at Canmet, but uh, that was really only a small part of of Canmet's uh, work. Canmet had a lot of their own in-house uh, research, and so it was really directed towards uh, improving, developing better new methods, uh, looking towards uh, energy env and environmental uh, effects due to the process itself. In other words, trying to work environment into the equation. Were there, what were the, the big, at the time, what were the big uh, environmental um, hazards or damages that were being caused by, by this uh, type of mining, by uranium? Well, it, the, uh, it was the radionuclides that were escaping and going into the tailings, and then the seepage from the tailings owed into the environment. So. There's many uh, radioactive daughters from uh, from a uranium ore. The uranium itself has a half life of about sixteen hundred and fifty years. But one of the other uh, elements that's radioactive is thorium two hundred and thirty, and that's 
over 4,000 years. Um, then you've got polonium and lead-210 and radium-226. These are all radioactive components. And, uh, but at that, at that time, we were really mostly concerned with uh, uranium and, and shortly after with radium. Um, on the, so those are in solution. We've got radon gas that comes off of the, the, the rock itself, uh, it's like underground. Um, we've got <clears throat> other types of radiation that comes off of bags of ore just sitting there, uh, waiting to be, say, trucked from A to B or flown from the Arctic down to the refinery, which was in Port Hope at the time. Now there's one at, at the Blind River, uh, which is just uh, west of Elliott Lake. <clears throat> so the uh, so there was all sorts of these developments on the hydrometallurgy, but also on the use of equipment in uh, well in the uranium process. Uh, the introduction of new technology that was being developed, say, at universities. Uh, or maybe somebody has just come from the university and all uh, very technically, he's got a good background in, in this one particular subject, so he introduces it to the, to the government labs and then the project will start. So there's th that type, but there's also uh, Um, in, in those days we had a lot of freedom of expression and uh, one could have an idea and uh, your boss even might shoot it down but uh, it wasn't cast and lead either you come back the next day and say look uh, I did try this, and uh, it worked. He said, let's say, go ahead and do it then. So you, it, it wasn't like uh, it has become sense. I don't know whether it is. I don't think it is this way now, but I think the previous government it was, they shut out everything. Uh, <clears throat> So it was, it was a time of uh, freedom of thinking and doing, and it was the criticism was that it was a glorified university the government labs had become. But uh, I think at places like NRC and and uh, the government labs at CANMED, I think, have proved that we we had uh, the talent to produce stuff for the future. It didn't have to be used today. It can be used in the future, and we should have that bank of information. <clears throat> uh, so there's... Uh, in, in my field, which uh, I, though I had uh, interest in the whole aspect of the hydrometallurgical flow sheet, and I had a section uh, eventually of about 35 people, about half of which were working on hydrometallurgy, and the other half were working on tailings, waste, and how to, uh, in developing a, a tailings management type of approach, and which I ended up writing a, a textbook on that subject. 
and a couple of textbooks on the hydrometeorological aspects, but devoted to only one unit operation, which is solvent extraction. And uh, <clears throat> that's that's from my, my personal endeavors uh, remain. That be, they became more of a hobby uh, in later years. And that's uh, because I, after retiring from CANMET in 89, I spent, uh, I think, 27 years uh, or 26 years as a private consultant. And uh, I was consulting in all aspects of hydrometallurgy, but particularly solvent extraction, and, uh, and also including the tailings management. So as I started giving short courses on both of those, in, uh, well, no, the solvent extraction in 71, and probably given a hundred or so of those courses. To, um, to schools or to, to, uh, <coughs> to companies? Uh, it's started out as open ones. Uh, anybody, well, really the, the very first courses I gave, uh, it was all to mostly the senior owners of mines, you know, it might be the owners, it might be the president uh, who attended, uh, people who knew nothing about <laughs> the engineering or the chemistry. But had a lot of money in, invested. Yeah, and they uh, wanted to, to know what this new project and process was all about. Could it help them? And uh, <clears throat> I remember giving one in uh, in Adelaide, uh, Australia, along with a friend of mine from the UK. And uh, I think there were something like 32 or 42 people there. They were all technical people of some sort, but uh, none of them had ever brushed anywhere as close to this process. And uh, what was the process called? A solvent extraction. Okay. So we'd gone four days or three and a half days of, of lectures and uh, they were getting a little more glass-eyed every day. And uh, so I called a halt to it, and I asked them, uh, for each one of them, to get a sheet of paper and put it up around the wall, around the room, and uh, with uh, their main problem, uh, plant problem, and uh, describe where that problem fit in their process. So it showed the flow sheet and, uh, and there's the problem there. Maybe they can't filter or maybe they uh, can't separate impurity out or something. And uh, then I said, okay, uh, we'll divide everybody up into groups of three or four. So I want a chemist, no one an engineer, and I want to hide anybody with hydrometallurgy experience. <clears throat> and uh, I said, we can probably solve a lot of these problems right here now. And, you know, everybody shook their head, not, not possible. Well, I think we solved all but two. Well, 
all with solvent extraction. Well, with with the group that was there, the, the, even though they none of them had worked together, they all had a good background in something, chemistry or engineering or some with hydrometallurgy. Some were accountants and knew things about uh, the costs of commodities. And uh, came up, they came up with some pretty good answers. So one of the, the, the major nickel company in Australia at the time, he came over to me in the last day, said, uh, you think you'd come out to Perth? Because that's on the other side of the, the country and I'm on the east side. Uh, and take a look at our operations and uh, give an in-house course on nickel for them. So I said, sure. So they adopted the process right away. And that was similar, similar through Canada and the States and uh, most countries. Uh, UK I gave a lot. Uh, a lot of Europeans came to the, the UK ones and uh, not too much mining in, in the UK, that is of min minerals. But they, lo and behold, uh, they had a plant up and running uh, on one of my processes within a couple of years. And uh, some of that technology went over to places in Europe. And uh, from there, trickled down to, uh, through Belgium and uh, uh, plants that they owned in the Congo. And get then the, a lot of this technology that we've been talking about in the course that suddenly started up that down there. Uh, so yeah, you really you really kind of applied it <coughs> in many many places around the world. Yeah, and yeah. and was extractive metallurgy. Did you have uh, uh, patents in uh, in uh, sorry solvent um, extraction? Yeah, I've got about 20, 20 21 filed patents. All uh, having to do with solvent extraction? Um, or mainly? Yeah, I fun. think there may be one or two that that aren't solvent extraction. Uh, what, yeah, there's one or two. And if you had to pick which one are you um, proudest <laughs> of or that, that sticks out the most or you believe is the most important? Well, the one that I believe is the most important isn't being used. Okay. <laughs> that, Explain. <laughs> so that that's called uh, solvent and pulp. And that that is we do solvent extraction, uh, apply the solvent to a, a slurry. The, after leaching, instead of filtering, we mix the solution with the slurry, take out the value. And uh, that means the solids going out, in, and this is with the uh, treated solution contains very little of, let's say, uranium. So instead of uh, a normal operation recovery of maybe 95 percent, which many of the plants are, uh, it'd be 99 something. Because if you filter it, you lose a lot of your values on the filter cake. And uh, you can only, it becomes an economic cost to uh, 
do multiple washings. So uh, that has the potential. Um, so somewhere in the I forget when it was. Anyway, dur during my uh, last part of working f with the government, I uh, had a uh, UN secondment through IEA to go to, to first Egypt and then it, um, China. And uh, China has uranium. Uh, Egypt doesn't have much, but China has uranium. They have a refinery and they've been processing since we started here in Canada, essentially, at least since uh, about the time the uh, Elliott Lake ores started, which would have been the late 50s. And plants looking very similar. And they wanted, and they had gone using uh, ion exchange uh, for the recovery of uranium. Became a very uh, inefficient pro uh, process for them. Uh, they had poor recoveries, high maintenance, high chemical costs, high energy costs. And so they sent me over there, the IEA sent me over there to try to get all these things lowered and increase the recovery object being to have a greater than 90% recovery with a, at least an 80% grade of product. So they did another uh, thing that, that I had, I didn't get a patent on this, uh, El Dorado didn't want to patent it, but uh, this is to produce a final product called ammonium urinal tricarbonate. And this you could produce at the plant, and owe to that by heating you can produce UO3, which is then uh, can be treated with hydrogen to produce UO2, and then we go from there to uh, the UO2 can do reactor type of stuff, mm -hmm. or you can go to uh, reducing it further to uranium metal into one of the other. Uh, 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 generating t station type of processes. So they had developed the same technology. As, so this was in the early 60s that I was working on that. And uh, we ran our pilot plants. We produced our UO2 up in Chalk River. And uh, it was suitable. Chinese found the same thing, and so they had that on this particular plant that I w worked at in China. So we converted that plant over to s solvent extraction, and uh, that uh, that is still still going, uh, very satisfactory. Now, in the meantime, they had. Uh, Seen, <clears throat> seen my reports on solvent and pulp. And there's several uh, papers, and there's a patent on it. They read these and uh, said to me, uh, the, the, at the Uranium Institute there, they told me, uh, work you did on solvent and pulp was very interesting. 
but there's one thing that you never did on you, you didn't get done. And I'm going to leave you to worry about it while you're lecturing today. So at the end of the day where I was uh, given, given some, well, I was given lectures every day for about 30 days, uh, he says, do you know what you didn't do? And I said, no, I can't think of it. He said, you didn't put it into practice. So I said, that's true. We almost had it into practice, but uh, in the, at our own plant. But we, uh, the geologists, uh, at the time that we were ready to go, the geologists said we didn't have enough ore. We we're going to have to close down in a couple of years, and we couldn't pay for the new plant. So it never did get put into practice. So they have, they have, have a solvent pulp plant, at least one, I was told, uh, for uranium, and they, I was also told they had one for vanadium. Uh, so that's that's a, a that was a, a process which I think is got a patent on it, but. Uh, it hasn't gone very far. Okay. But well, sometimes it <clears throat> sometimes it takes time. Yes. So the 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 really the patent has gone furthest, and uh, that and most work has been done on it is cobalt nickel separation. Okay. And there's a big flurry in Australia. Different companies using it. Uh, various reasons uh, why they never really made a good success. Um, either using the wrong equipment, uh, some little thing in the design. Uh, Companies can become very protective of their technology or the plant that they put in. Uh, they don't like somebody like myself coming along <laughs> and telling them that uh, uh, you've done it wrong. Yeah. So it's it's un, a bit unfortunate, uh, but we applied the same this same process in Cuba, and. Uh, Three or four successful pilot plants were run. We applied the same process uh, to ore in uh, Burundi, Central East Africa. That's another place that I worked. Um, pilot plants were run in Arizona and uh, a very large one in Burundi. Um, so it's Depends much on the mineralogy of the ore and the uh, design mm -hmm. configuration of the plant, materials construction, and so many things uh, separating a, a winner from a loser. For sure. Well, yeah. that's that's what's so uh, tricky and delicate with chemistry. Yeah. Just one little thing. And, uh, yeah, and. Uh, it, so it's a continuing challenge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's what keeps me with it. That's for sure. Um, I'll, um, <clears throat> we'll, switch, we'll switch it up just a little bit, and I have a few more questions, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. Okay. Um, these are more uh, social questions. So throughout your career, um, how absent or present were women in the workplace, and has that changed? <clears throat> I think it's changed uh, from sort of almost zero to a hundred now, and uh, when, when I started, uh, let's see, in my class in university, I think we had two women, and I think 
that first year class was probably a hundred. Wow. Uh, time when I got down to uh, graduate school, there was just this one girl, the one that I was working with, it was mm -hmm. the only one. There was uh, I think eight of us on the graduate program that we eight had started, but I think there was only eight of us into graduate studies. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now you go to the universities, it doesn't matter where you go in the world. Uh, I would say that there's at least 50% are women. Yeah, in universities, yes. Yeah. yeah, there's actually more women now than men Yeah. Uh, in, uh, in university. Yeah. But as for, so. uh, it's still lower though for... Um, in the workplace. The workplace, um, but also um, for your specifics like uh, uh, engineering, uh, the sciences especially, but, but more the natural resource industry, that's still... Um, I think it's around the twenty in the twenty percent. Oh yeah, yeah, I think. But in terms of in general, yeah, the population of women at, in university is now higher than men. Yeah. yeah. Now there's in the, in a lot of the uh, a lot of the solvent extraction plants ar around the world. Um, many plants, the leader is a woman, and. Um, the technicians out on the plant are women. So I think I found the greatest number of women in uh, Finland, I think. Oh, yeah? I think it was Finland. Finland and Russia also had a lot. Okay. You, uh, another question, you traveled a lot, uh, where, uh, just for fun, where was uh, your favorite place to go? If you, had well, to I guess, if you had to pick one. I guess it was Australia. Yeah, Australia? Yeah. I was there more than 60 times. Wow, okay, <laughs> no kidding, wow. Uh, but I guess the more you go to a place, the more you like it. Yeah. So, uh, a lot of these, a lot of these places, I wouldn't go back uh, necessarily. Uh, you know, I, I liked Egypt as a country. Uh, their attitude towards production was rather slack. While I was there, uh, they would be incredible and uh, very dedicated because all they, many of the professionals wanted to go one step higher and get their PhD. So the, the projects, almost all the projects that I had to that I was looking after in uh, at the atomic energy in Cairo was uh, PhD oriented. So while I would be there on a visit, um, those PhD students were working very hard. When I when I would leave, research almost stopped. The, mm -hmm. Just, just know uh, the initiative wasn't there. But you go to China, and it's quite different. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of women there in uh, the plant. A lot of engineers. They were engineers and chemists and uh, really smart people. Uh, I would leave them uh, with what I thought was be enough work for three or four months, 
and I'd get a call from IEA saying, look, we, we've got the report of the uh, work you left them. They're ready for you to come back. I says, that's poss not possible. It's only a month. No, they've got it all done. So I could go back again and well, wow, pretty efficient. Efficient, and and the men, uh, the women were just every bit as good as the men. Perhaps a little more, more detailed. That's what I hear. That or they're also more uh, careful. Um, yeah, they're, they're careful, and uh, but th they will protest quicker than the men. If they don't like it, they'll yeah, tell you. They'll let you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in any language. Yeah. Um, Another question I like to ask is, um, do you believe there's a disconnect between the mining industry, the natural resource industry, and the rest of the world, the, the general public? I think there is, definitely. And, uh, and how so? Why is that? I think it's all communication, or lack of it. Uh, people don't have the time to read, it seems. I mean, I'm, I'm a great reader, but I don't read nearly enough uh, about uh, what's going on technically. We don't, you take a look at TV and the percentage of news that's technical related to our resources or to medicine or to agriculture it's next to nil. Uh, so if people aren't hearing it and seeing it, reading it, and if they're not, are not of an inquiring mind in that subject, they're not, they're not listening. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think I think this is one of the reasons. Uh, I mean, I, I felt when I was with the government that there was this terrible disconnect. People out there really didn't understand what we were doing. And uh, <clears throat> certainly the, uh, the governing body at the time, very little of them understood. And I was... Uh, assigned to the minister's office, Minister Mines' office, for six months back in the, I guess it was some, uh, somewhere around the mid-1970s. And part of my duties was to spend uh, every, every morning, every afternoon in question period in Parliament. Uh, had to be at my desk at eight o'clock in the morning, and by that time the minister already had gone through stuff, and he'd have a bunch of file folders on my desk with different colors, so different priorities, some of which had to be in by nine o'clock. These were the ones he had to <clears throat> deal with in Parliament that afternoon. So you go through the press question period, and then they break for. Uh, you go down the cafeteria and have lunch then or dinner, and then uh, into these committees. Maybe the committees are only five or ten people. These committee meetings might go to three o'clock in the morning. You're back at work at eight, and. I found it very enlightening uh, listening to some of these questions and listening to the answers, realizing that here are these, these are the people who are governing our country and they haven't got an idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, So, you know, you 
he, from the professional side, the professional can find out very easy because he just has to go to a conference, and he, all the same thinking people are there, and and uh, you learn, but. Uh, Unfortunately, the, there's a long distance between the person out in the street and the and the scientist or the the chemist, the chemist and the engineer, Absolutely. geologist. Uh, we, we have such a a wealth of knowledge in Canada. Canada was really one of the, was the leader in mining and metallurgy when I started my career. And uh, we took a big hit this past 10 years and sort of dropped behind a cloud. But uh, there's much of what's going on around the world in mining, metallurgy, geology, exploration, developed right here in Canada. All the uh, <clears throat> all the uh, exploration, geology uh, done in Egypt, for instance, was done by our geologists at Geological Survey here, dating back. Oh, twenties, thirties. Um, I was I was quite fascinated uh, in my num number of trips to Egypt to find out uh, how highly the Egyptians thought of Canadian scientists and geologists. The, the, just the whole community. Yeah. Um, and I think Australia, the same thing. When I first went there in 76, uh, they were quite a ways behind us. Yeah. But uh, they had all sorts of Canadian techniques they were doing. Oh yeah, we were uh, we were um, leaders in many oh, yeah. facets of mining metallurgy throughout the sixties, seventies, eighties. Yeah, I think about uh, uh, nineteen seventy nine or eighty. On one of my trips there, uh, I was asked by their OSIMM equivalent or our CIM. If I could give a talk on uh, on what we're doing here in Canada on resources, because the Australians would like to hear whether they're going the right way, because they at that time they were uh, producing concentrates of anything they could they could produce and sh shipping it to Japan. And uh, of course, I came over with a different story. I, you know, I said, "Well, our objective is to produce final products where we can, if it's going to be economic for us, and uh, ship the final product over." But I says, "Even that, we're not doing enough of. We should be aiming for more." Uh, final products and uh, less concentrates. But we do that with everything. We do it with uh, wood. We ship over the wood and we buy plywood back at very high prices. So uh, it's, it's a philosophy uh, of management in the future that we should be thinking of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, last question for you, and that's if you were talking to someone uh, much younger, like a student, for example, 
What, what would be the most important piece of advice or life lesson you could give them? Mm. Well, if you're lucky, you, you have a, you've had a good mentor. I was lucky and I had a wonderful, wonderful mentor who was the, he was my boss from day one. Then when I joined El Dorado, he came over about six months later and became my boss again. And uh, and we became the best of friends. This was Harvard Ness. So that's number one, if you can hook up with somebody who's, who can tell you everything and, and still be your friend. I think you have to be a good listener. Uh, I think uh, another thing with respect to success, and certainly with mine, has been to be able to work with a team. That to be on your own uh, is too secluded, I think. Synergism is gained with numbers. And I think the last thing is that you've got to run with your ideas. Uh, you can't let convention uh, stop you from thinking. I think that it has <clears throat> so many things that I've done, patents that have resulted, have been because I said I don't believe it until I see it. And uh, cobalt nickel is the best example of that. That's why it's one of my best patents, uh, because the literature says that you cannot separate nickel and cobalt unless you do multi-precipitation crystallizations. And uh, of course, that makes it very expensive. That's one reason why cobalt was expensive. Uh, I didn't believe it. <clears throat> I figured, well, yeah, there's got to be a way of, uh, if we use something like solvent extraction, where we uh, have a lot of chemistry going for us, and we've got valencies, and we've got pHs, we can uh, do something with this coordination. And uh, my partner, friend, Al Mashbrook, we, who was a great chemist, <clears throat> much better chemist than me, uh, we we looked at this uh, tantalizing question of, of cobalt nickel, saying it has to be, we should be able to break that. And we did all these tests one day, little beakers, probably a hundred or so that morning. And uh, nothing worked, nothing worked. So we had a whole counter of beakers we left when we went to lunch. We came back after lunch and there was one beaker there where we had a beautiful pink up in the upper layer, cobalt, and down below we had the bluish green of nickel. We had made the separation. Didn't have anything written on the, didn't know what <laughs> test that was. <laughs> So it took us a couple of days to figure that one out. So another piece of advice, be organized. <laughs> well, label your stuff. <laughs> label your stuff, yeah, well, we, that took time, so we didn't, <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Uh, so we, uh, we found out the reason, and we, we were able to repeat that test, and, uh, 
my friend, the mentor, and other senior people from the lab at El Dorado in Tunney's Pasture here uh, were left left uh, the left town for a day, I think, or so, meetings so elsewhere. Anyway, it ended up that I was the top man on the totem pole, and I was in charge. So uh, when you're in charge, you you make changes if you can. <laughs> so <clears throat> we decided between Alan and I to run a, this pilot plant with this, what we thought might be a new process. And uh, we run them in these columns, which was also new for, they've been used for uranium, but I was used, going to now use them for cobalt nickel because there could be a many theoretical stages in there, which is what happened, it was. So we had this running and uh, all the brass returns about three o'clock that afternoon. And uh, there's best beautiful technicolor, all the pink coming off and the blue going out the bottom. And so Harvard says, what have you got there? And I says, that's the impossible. It's cobalt nickel separation. That's, he says, great. He says, we got to continue that, which we did. And uh, so we, we produced products, we sold them. It was only the start, but it's the, it's the one where you, if I follow the dream. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And did the impossible. And did the impossible. Well, then, some, then somebody wrote a song there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Okay. Appreciate it.